Without any further ado, I uh, hand over Alistair King, founder and um, creative king haha, uh, at King James. Alistair is the founding creative partner of the King James Group, having written his first ads on a typewriter. <laughs> Alistair's copywriting career of almost 30 years has spanned the full breadth of advertising of the advertising industry's technological and digital evolution. He has personally been voted South Africa's most admired creative director four years in a row by industry survey Mark Lives. And in 2018, it was inducted into the Creative Circle Hall of Fame. Alistair also sits on the Red and Yellow School Advisory Board. And I, and I must say, my experience uh, with this man has always been phenomenal. He, he is genuinely, in terms of people in the industry right now, uh, Alistair is, he, he is a, he's a remarkable leader. Uh, he's run an incredible business. Uh, to be independent after all of these years is, is a phenomenal achievement for most of us gave up uh, um, and, and sold out many years ago. Uh, Al, it's such a privilege to have you here today. I know you're going to entertain us. So let me stop waffling and uh, hand over to Alistair King. Thank you, Rob. Um, welcome to another weird day in lockdown. I, I hope you're all healthy and living your best lockdown possible. Um, it's terrific to be here. It's the first time I've, not the first time I've spoken at this event, but certainly the first time I've spoken to, to, to people in this manner. Um, and I remember the first time Rob asked me to come and do this. And I, and I said to him, you know, you, you know my point of view, Rob. I'm a, I'm a kind of a generalist. I built an agency that happens to do a lot of things and, and, and I'm, I'm obsessed about none of them and all of them. Um, why me? Why should I talk? Why can I, how, how can I come and add value? Um, and he said, you must just come and tell us what your secret source is. Come and tell us everything that you know. And, and the joke's on you, Rob, because right now, what does anyone know? <laughs> what, is, what does anyone know for certain? What's concrete about the future of our business at this point in time? And, and, and it felt a bit weird for me to come and talk about work we've done, work that's won us some awards and, and how we've worked because I, even as we speak, we're kind of changing how we work. So um, I wanted to come at this uh, differently and I wanted to perhaps bring something to, to the table that might be useful to all of you right now um, under these kind of wonderful, crazy times. About six, oh, about three months ago, I, made, I posted a tweet about... Um, and I caught the attention of Business Insider and he then called me and asked me to elaborate on what I'd said. Um, and I basically suggested that in 22 years of business, King James hasn't really had a business plan. We, we tend to work in six month increments. We focus on the now, we, we, we leave ourselves open to evolve our company and, and, and rather than add the pressure to our business by, by um, setting us up on a path we committed to, we like to kind of roll with circumstances and and it was a very it got a, a very big response at the time because obviously it's a very contrarian view for business um and i said things like business is tricky and unpredictable lots of things happen outside of your control um and you can't talk about being the agency of the future if you can't be the agency of now um and that was uh, in in mid january i think and and here we are right now in, with unforeseen circumstances. We're all making it up as we go along. We're all scrambling. We're all grappling with um, how to make advertising. Um, and we're all dealing with the same challenges. We're, we're all remote, struggling with everything that goes with that. Uh, we're all facing personal challenges, uh, financial challenges, emotional challenges, isolation challenges, work challenges, and creative challenges. And um, and I wanted to talk about that because I think that I've got something quite useful that I think might help you through this interesting times. We all have clients as well that are that face a myriad of their own realities and have faced their own their own challenges. Um, some of our clients have products and services that are not considered essential items, so they're not available to us. They're not available to be purchased. They're closed or simply not allowed to sell. Uh, some clients are fighting to keep their clients from cancelling their policies. Some are actively investing directly and indirectly to COVID in the fight against COVID and they want their customers to know about it. 
Some just want to say their thoughts and prayers are with you. And we all know what that's like, those conversations with our clients are like. But of course, our job as marketing partners is to find a way to do that in an appropriate way, in a way that adds value to our clients and rather than erode it. And that throws up a lot of debate, as you've no doubt noticed. There's a lot of social media chatter about how brands communicate over this crisis and over this period and whether in fact they should be communicating at all. Um, everyone appears to be an expert in everyone else's communication strategy. And, and, I, and I get that. Um, social media is where you get to mind everyone else's business, I suppose. But it seems to me that the loudest voices opposing brands advertising over this period are people in advertising itself. And that, that kind of confuses me a lot. Um, our entire industry relies on us keeping busy, on, on us helping our clients keep their brands alive and healthy through this period. Uh, we can talk about priorities, but most of our clients employ people who are also our priority. And that's why we exist. That's, that's what we do. Um, that's why we're here. Um, we're here to make people consider our clients' products and services, regardless of the circumstances. So I'm here to talk about the extraordinary conundrum uh, we face, and I'm hoping to give you some valuable insights that I stumbled upon as marketing communicators. We talk about this period as unprecedented, but I'm hopefully gonna show you that there is precedent, credibly speaking, and there is something we can learn from the past. So other than keeping my company health, healthy and my, my people busy, let me talk about the one thing that keeps me awake at night, and it is this. This is what really keeps me awake at night, is creativity, um, and the fact that it's taking a bit of a battering over this period. Now, a lot of people I know will say, no, that's not true. COVID-19 is forcing us to be innovative and resourceful um, by finding solutions to challenging situations, and I wouldn't disagree with that. But creativity, as I think of it, is a very fragile thing, um, not just in advertising, but across all artistic expressions of it. Uh, it's so easy to smother and suppress it. And my view of advertising is, is hardly profound. Um, it's unlike all of yours, I'm sure. The, the best way to capture people's, anyone's imagination is to show them something they didn't expect to see. And creativity is no more complicated than that to me. The very essence of creativity is originality, and originality comes from diverse ideas, diverse perspectives, diverse interpretations of the same subjects. Um, and the things that grab my imagination, that hit me with any real emotional weight and impact, always come from left field. Uh, they're always unexpected and way off piece, and we strive for that as an agency, as I'm sure you all do. As often as as often as simple, it's often as simple as not, as, as not doing what everyone else is doing. Yinging when they yang, simple principles that are easy to talk about but quite hard to pull off. Uh, because many clients simply feel uncomfortable when ideas don't feel like others, like, like others, others' ideas. But think about life before COVID. Uh, think about the absolute volume of ideas that you got to enjoy and the way you got to enjoy them. I mean, if you think about film alone, there was in 19, uh, 2017, 2019, there was The Joker, uh, Parasite, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, 1917, Irishman. The only things these films had in common were that they are films. And every film is different from each other, as you can imagine. Uh, every film is its own curveball, its own creative curveball. And if you think of music in 2019, it's the same applies. One minute, one, one minute you were heading down old, old Town Road and, and the next you were Dance Monkey. And that's the beauty of living in a world that's firing ideas at you constantly. It's like playing pinball. You really don't know what's going to come at you next. And it's that unpredictable randomness that thrills us and makes us feel alive. But we're not getting that from advertising right now, are we? Um, Every piece of communication feels heavy and sentimental. And uh, I, for one, feel I'm drowning in human empathy and, and not necessarily in a good way. Um, and I was wondering if we are the only ones being weighed down by the situation, which is obviously a serious one. 
So I called a close friend of mine who is a musician who writes and performs his own music. And, and I asked him, how is your songwriting going right now? And how, how are you, what are you writing about? And, and his reply was interesting. He said, um, this COVID thing is really heavy <laughs> and doesn't necessarily sit naturally with the themes that he generally writes about. And so he's just not really managing to find, to find kind of, he's not really finding the inspiration where he needs it right now. Um, it's draining him, I guess, credibly. Uh, and I know how that feels personally. And that's the thing about COVID. Unless you're talking about COVID or singing about something that relates to COVID, you just look like you're tone deaf. Um, you look like you aren't aware of the state of the world and, and you look like you're insensitive to those experiencing it full on. Uh, COVID is, uh, I guess, all about COVID. Uh, and you can't really put a song out right now about the beautiful woman that caught your eye across the dance floor or riding down Route 66 with the wind in your hair. Um, people would say, dude, you're just out of sync with the world. You need to write about separation and loneliness and fear and hope, and you need to write about COVID things. Um, and I saw a, a BBC insert about the next wave coming out of Hollywood as we speak, and all of them are obviously about COVID. Uh, there's romance films, people in lockdown falling in love, people in lockdown falling out of love, which I think is probably a bit easier. Um, Crime, crime films, all relative to COVID, um, murder during COVID, heists during COVID, horror films, people stuck in lifts with COVID patients, uh, hero, hero films about the people at the front line. These are, this is all coming out of Hollywood right now um, and from all, all around the world. And I, so it is to be expected. I'm not criticizing it. I, I'm just giving you a context. Um, COVID is not just the biggest subject in the world. Um, today, it's the only subject. And, and our entire output is relative to COVID. Our, everything we do is framed by COVID, uh, particularly in advertising. Um, and you couldn't really put out a lack of movie right now about gnomes falling in love with goblins because the context wouldn't feel right. And uh, even poor James Bond, the ultimate escapist film franchise, was halted because it had the word die in it. And and but be honest, who wouldn't give an eye teeth your eye teeth right now to watch something escapist that's not about COVID? Um, and that is why creativity, in my view, is in, in is in contraction right now. Uh, we only have one piece of subject matter to work with. It's literally consuming all the cool theme, all the cool themes we used to call on. And I, and, I, and obviously, it's justified given the enormity of the challenge and the enormity of of what we're dealing with. Um, but for now, creativity as we've known it is, is paused and we now have to apply our creativity to this particular subject. Um, so before COVID, you'd, you'd sit with the brands you work on, beer brands, chicken brands, um, insurance companies, banks, sports shoe brands, uh, whatever you, you work on, and you'd think, what is so good about this product? What makes it useful uh, and important to people's lives? And, and there was no limit to what we could do with that question. Um, now we're wondering how does this brand remain relevant when COVID is the only thing on people's minds. So we are starting to build COVID related themes into our brand narratives because it feels insensitive not to, um, although it sometimes feels insensitive to do so. Um, so this made me wonder whether there was any other period in history where humankind was as focused and absorbed on one subject because I wanted to see how creativity survived during that time. And that, that led me to World War II. Uh, it's the only period in history where everyone on earth was facing the same danger or the same threat. Um, today, we're facing a virus. Back then, they faced the enemy of war. And uh, there was no other subject other than that war, no matter whose side you were on. And it turns out, uh, that we can learn a lot from World War II. I discovered some fascinating similarities to how we're dealing with COVID. Um, keeping in mind that both film, music, and advertising were all uh, exploding in the late 30s uh, leading up to the war. So in many ways, there's incredible parallels between our media. Um, this is a list of the most popular songs in World War II, and you'll see they're um, all about war. Don't be 
don't let's be got beastly to the Germans. Kiss me good night, Sergeant Major. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition, my personal favorite. Um, um, and there's, a, there's an incredibly diverse set of emotions in them, but every single one is framed by um, COVID, uh, by, by World War II. And just anecdotally, I want to share the most, the biggest song of, 20, uh, of World War II, and it was this song written by a lady named Lali Anderson. <laughs> der Kaserne vor dem großen Tor stand eine Laterne und steht sie noch davor. So wollen wir uns da wieder sehen, bei der Laterne wollen wir stehen. Wie einst Lili Mali, wie einst Lili Mali. Um. And that, was, that song was so huge because um, it was written, bizarrely, as a, as a piece of propaganda by, um, for the Germans. The Germans used it as propaganda and it ended up being used as propaganda for the Allies. But the lyrics were essentially as powerful and as meaningful to both opposing sets of armies. And that's why, um, that's what it was all about. It's a fascinating song because it's really about love. It's about separation. It's about war. Um, and if you look at the films of World War II, you get exactly the same scenario. Uh, these films, every single variation of, World War, of war was in these films, from um, action to mystery. Um, and some were more propaganda in nature. And, this, and I've got a good mix of, of films around the world from Japan and Russia and, and Germany and Italy and the US. Um, but what I discovered in looking at film and music and eventually advertising in World War II is that we always tend to go through the same set of phases uh, when, we go, when we're handling a crisis. And we, we, these are the first stage, stage one, keep calm, make jokes. And in both World War II and now, if you remember what it was like right in the beginning when we started to um, realize that this, this corona existed and it was far away in Wuhan and we were quite... We were quite relaxed about it. In fact, we were quite rude about it. We made jokes, we were very chilled, and we made fun of, we made fun of the fact that we were safe and it was far away and it was no threat to us. And this was very consistent. Like in World War II, a lot of the initial stuff was, was this. It was all jokey advertising. It was uh, quite um, racist in many ways uh, against the Japanese and the Germans. But, but communication and advertising was all, was all, was all fun. And, and, um, no one really thought of this as an imminent danger. And then stage two is this. Oops, shit just got real. Um, and you'll remember those emotions when suddenly the first cases were reported in South Africa, or the first, then there was a slight pullback, which went, okay, oops, maybe this isn't such a joke. And, um, and we became a little bit more circumspect. And the same happened in, in advertising. These are all posters from World War II. And you, and you can see how now I, I just want you to think about your brands and how you're trying to, uh, trying to insert your brands into the conversation. And, and the link is quite tenuous, as you can see. I mean, uh, some things, uh, these, this is tires, you know, very loosely linked. Uh, this is about chocolate uh, fueling the soldiers. But, but communication started to change because suddenly it was becoming more real. They're coming to get us. Uh, and it started to become a little bit more anxiety filled. Um, this is a Russian piece of advertising, which presumably says, um, keep quiet, don't let anyone hear you. And then stage three, alert, alert to your battle stations. And um, this is, this communication has taken on this tone very, very much. And if you think about Corona, we took on this very, very fast. This is what we need to do. This is how we can beat it. Uh, it's very educational in nature, very informative, very action orientated. And ironically, there was also a fund drawn up in World War II. And um, it was essentially a fund drawn up to fight, to, to, to finance the war effort. And lots of encouragement was used. These are the things that all communication was about this. Uh, let's build. Uh, we need money. Uh, uh, rationing. Uh, th these are very familiar themes. <laughs> To, to what we've been going through, funnily enough. And war bonds in particular was essentially how they financed the war. They said buy war bonds. It was more of an investment than a donation. 
Um, today, our Solidarity Fund is much more of a humanitarian appeal, um, but, it, but consistently it's giving people a way to contribute to the war efforts or the, the battle against COVID. Um, and brands also announced back then that they were contributing to the war efforts, sometimes realistically and sometimes just in spirit. And the link between some brands and the war effort was really pretty tenuous. And that, but that didn't stop them. Um, so these are some more war bonds ads. Um, but in fact, um, I found this reference from this uh, lecturer in the US and he referred to a thing called brag ads in World War II. And brag ads were identified as ads where the main intent focused more on promoting the merits of a corporation product or service than on encouraging patriotism or support of the war effort. And I know that all of you have probably been having these conversations with your clients saying, should we be advertising? And surely this shouldn't, surely COVID is not a marketing opportunity. Um, and and I, I know that we've all been going through the same thing, but back then in World War II, some of these ads were, uh, were quite tenuous to say the least. Uh, Chesterfield tried to convince you that you had more, more, um, more breath to blow a whistle and the motor industry was really punting its role in, in, in tanks. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because agencies back then were clearly as conflicted with how they present their, their client's brand as we are now. But th phase three is also when we start to acknowledge the heroes amongst us. Um, uh, this is an interesting quote um, about the fact that uh, brands back then were battling to promote themselves while simultaneously promote the right ethics towards the war, the right attitude. Um, and as you can see, some pulled it off better than some. Everything was war related. But phase three was also where we started to acknowledge the heroes amongst us, uh, the people that are literally putting their lives at risk. And we are in that phase right now where we are thanking the people at the front line and not just um, the medical world, but also the people in the shops and uh, everyone who's playing a role. And, um, and no doubt more and more people are gonna come to that party and more and more people will be our heroes. So this is how various countries back then acknowledged it. kind of a universal um, human reaction to any situation, I guess. Some Russian posters. But what's also interesting is that many brands simply became unavailable during the war. They were taken off the shelves or made unavailable because they weren't regarded as essential to the war effort. And I, this is exactly the same narrative I found in, in, in World War II than, I'm, than I find in COVID. Um, they didn't, but that didn't necessarily stop advertising from adverti advertisers from advertising. Many brands continue to advertising for this reason. And I thought this might be useful to you if you're facing a client that says, well, I'm pulling my brands and putting my advertising. We'll, we'll, we'll push it again when we come back online. Um, but this is an interesting perspective. Uh, you should never really stop advertising because when you do come back, consumers are going to need your name. So use that or don't use that. But while these first three phases happened over many years, playing out relatively slow motion, um, our experiences with COVID has been condensed like it's on, it's on steroids because phase four has already, already feels like it's coming through in our narrative today. Um, and phase four is, is a better world awaits us all. And so, um, we're talking all about this. Uh, we're talking about hope uh, because this is a heavy subject. We need to start making people think about what's ahead of us. Um, I suppose in World War II, you had to talk about the future because soldiers would have nothing to fight for. Uh, there's nothing like hope for a better tomorrow to help you get through all this. And I suppose it's easy to start feeling overwhelmed by our circumstances. So it's perfectly natural to start to put up messages of hope and optimism. Um, a lot of our advertising today is starting to do this. And you would have noticed that a lot of advertising talk about COVID recalibrating us and helping us reassess what is important to us, helping Earth recover from the environmental damage we've done. Um, so we're already shifting our narrative away from immediately stressing us. And I stumbled upon this remarkable piece of work um, from 1943, and it really blew my mind in so many ways because it it gave me 
it illustrated for me how brands can wiggle out of this very oppressive context that we have right now. It gave me a clue that in fact, it's possible to talk about, uh, to be sensitive to our environment and our circumstances, but not make it relative to COVID. Um, and this piece of work is regarded as the best piece of work um, during the war effort. And it was from a, a brand called Libby Owens Ford. Um, and Libby Owens Ford is a glass company. And they created this campaign called Kitchens of the Future. And uh, I thought this was really interesting because for once they didn't talk about the war. They talked about, they changed the subject completely. And the subject became the future. The subject became after the war, the great things we have to look forward to. Um, and I suppose this gave valuable respite from the anxiety of war. It was larger than life, it was spectacular, and, and it was virtually the stuff of science fiction. And I, I've got a little, I've got the original, these are some of the original frame grabs from it that showed you just how magical the, the, the kitchen of the future would be. But I cannot underestimate how huge this campaign was. It, it absolutely grabbed millions and millions and millions of people's imaginations, people who were so exhausted and so saturated with, with, um, with anxiety about the war and about messages about the war. This thing completely opened up. It, went, it almost went back to the days when, no, we're right, I don't even have to think about the war for a brief moment. And, and this is the original footage, which I found in an, ar in an archive. Um, it's pretty cool, uh, pretty interesting. But what really fascinated, what really blew my mind about this campaign is that um, essentially what they did was they built three kitchens and they built them in the homes of, of, of the execs of the, of the, uh, the company that's, that's owned the company. Then what they did was, and they built it using award-winning interior designers, and it was featured in all sorts of architectural and lifestyle magazines as both editorial and advertorial. So it started out as a kind of piece of, of print, print material. Then they got Paramount to come and film this film that you're watching now. And Paramount then made three different films, and they started to run them all over the country. Um, so it became, a, I guess, a, a film campaign. This caused so much excitement um, and the PR was immense, uh, and, and that gained massive earned media. It was discussed in other magazines, was discussed on, on the radio at length. Um, it really gripped people's imaginations. And then they took those kitchens, and then they took them on tour around the country. Uh, and it be so it became an installation of sorts, and millions and millions and millions of people fl flocked to, to see these installations. And so, I regard this as one of the first integrated campaigns I've ever encountered. And uh, the only thing missing was social media uh, and even and digital uh, and e a digital showing of it. And even that, and even that I think was substituted by good old fashioned word of mouth because people came in their millions to see it. And the campaign went on, the campaign went on and was emulated by many, many other brands as good campaigns always do. And, um, so when we talk about integration today, um, we talk about it as, as if it's some kind of brand new invention and we are the experts in integration and we're, we've, we've mastered it and we've worked it out. Um, and, I th and, and I think that that's quite funny now that I've seen this because um, integration and integrated communication is as old as the industry itself. I just wanted to share this very quickly, this little piece of film, which is the same idea copied by GM. like none I've seen. Put a card in the slot and onto the screen pops a picture of just how your dish will look, plus all the ingredients you need to cook. No need for the bride to feel tragic. The rest is push-button magic. So whether you bake or broil or stew, the Frigidaire Kitchen does it all for you. Don't have to be chained to the stove all day. Just set the timer and you're on your way. Tick tock, tick tock, I'm free to have fun around the clock. Jeepers, 
I'm exhausted. The kitchen of tomorrow is calling me. My cake is ready. Time for the show. Everybody on stage. I thought that that was just really reassuring to see that in history we've um, we've got some things we can learn. I think we we're not going through a unique experience in that in in that regard. And I think it's nice. It's reassuring to see that. Um, that uh, humanity tends to go through these patterns of communication. And it certainly feels to me that we can learn a lot from how we start to communicate to our, to our, to people now. What I am excited about is when this thing passes, there is going to be an absolute explosion, um, creative explosion. Uh, I think we're going to need to get to work very fast. We're going to, um, we're going to be dealing with an ex with so much excitement, so much anticipation, and we're going to have to work harder with the money that we're given. So I hope you'll forgive me for not coming and showing King James's work and um, talking about how we made it. I, I felt that I'm never going to have another opportunity to talk about stuff that is so powerful and so um, the circumstances that we're in right now. And um, frankly, seeing uh, um, Pete and Cabela's presentation, I'm glad I didn't uh, throw up a couple of slides about our agency because uh, that was very impressive. So. Um, I really just wanted to say, um, hang in there, think hard, do some cool stuff, try to get through this in a well, and um, take care of yourselves. And thank you for listening to me. Al, thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, never a, again or before will I get a chance to see the kitchen of the future circa 70 odd years ago. Um, it is so typical of you to have <laughs> pulled that out the bag. Uh, I, I would love to have uh, experienced that late night inspiration session on your browser when you started to figure out all of this. Al, we've got a whole lot of questions for you and, and not a huge amount of time, so I'm going to cut straight to it. Um, the first one from Kate DeVette, it's, it's a very practical question, uh, and not a creative question, uh, or not a creative oriented question. Speaking of historical moments of the past, one that really sticks with us um, uh, is the Great Depression. There's a lot of talk about how the global economy may be on the brink of depression, even greater than that of the past. In saying this, and in conjunction with South Africa's broken economy, what do you think this means for agencies such as King James as their clients and companies are really starting to tighten their belts? What are, what are the practical implications for, for agencies? Fighting for our businesses and, 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 and our people's jobs is the biggest subject in, in our life right now. Um, there really is no bigger subject. So. Um, we obviously are working out how this is going to end and, and how, uh, how our agency will look coming out of it. And we already have some very strong ideas. What I know as a fact, and I, I knew this after day one of lockdown, um, is that creativity uh, doesn't work, in, work remotely in my view, at least my definition of creativity, which is people talking to each other, bouncing ideas, um, I can literally work through every single piece of work we've ever done that's of, of any merit. And I, you can almost pinpoint um, how it happened and, and, the, and the chemistry that, uh, that allowed it to happen. And it's an extraordinary creativity is, is a lot of serendipitous. It's a lot of anecdotes. It's a lot of, it's, it's just this festering buzz that essentially throws up a new idea and then people run with it. I find working remotely doesn't do that. So in my mind, going forward, um, we might have to rethink how we work as an agency and certainly in semi-lockdown. But, but I'm keen to get the creative people, that, the, put the creative people together that actually are responsible for conceptual stuff and we can outsource that. Um, it's, this, it's this line of connectivity. Our clients are also battling. Our clients are paying. Um, they, they've got big business to run. They've got stakeholders and they've got people to employ. So, so our job is to keep their businesses healthy at, while, and while simultaneously keeping ours. So my view is that um, I don't like this way of working. I've seen the remote narrative being punted for, for a long time, mainly by people who tend to work remotely. But um, it doesn't work for a creative agency in my view. Um, it's all about people and people looking each other in the face. Did I answer that question? Well, yeah, I, I really do think you answered it well. Um, 
certainly from my experience, creative sparks 50% of the time are going to come from the place you least expect it. And in most cases, that's people. Um, I find often taking a spark to a more fully fledged idea, I would personally better do alone. Um, and there I find remote work without the distractions of, of someone wanting five minutes. Um, yeah. I find it very helpful, but, but you know, there's just no taking humans out of the equation. Humans are what drive empathy and empathy is what drives great ideas. Understanding humans is what drives yeah. great ideas. We just cannot do that in isolation. I find Let me jump on to the next question. Lost in translation. Yes. No, I just yes. find a lot being lost in translation between conversations and it's, it, that, that's the part that for me is so critical. 100%. Al, my next question is from Kira de Toy. She says, Alice, you are a great example of what it means to be a multifaceted, multi-talented person. What advice can you give to someone to ensure that we do not let our job titles inhibit our creative abilities? I love that question. Oh. I suppose it's as simple as abandoning your job title. I mean, <laughs> I know that's, uh, I, I, and I know when you do abandon your job title, agencies are the first people to say, but what do you do? What's your expertise? What is your leaning? Because they kind of need you to f slot into an existing role. Um, generalists are quite hard to, to market um, because they, they, they kind of, agencies have a, have, a, a, have a role that they have to fill. And when you come and you say, well, I do lots of things. It doesn't quite answer the thing. Um, but, you know, your job, to, I mean, we've built our own prisons in a way by, by calling people um, art director, senior art director, credit, group head, creative director. And eventually it just, it's about how good are you, I guess, how, how good are your ideas. And I've met uh, executive credit directors that don't have great ideas and I've met um, uh people with three years expense that are firing from all, um, from all directions. So talent is a kind of a thing that, that uh, um, you have or you don't have. And it's something you build upon and you grow over time. Experience is a valuable thing. So your title, you kind of earn your title because um, it's an indication of you having grown some wisdom in your mind. But I, I'm, not a, uh, I, I'm not sure why we have titles. And, I, and certainly we've tried to break down in King James. We, we just have creative people who work in the creative hub and then we have specialist people who are hired to do specialist things. But even in the creative hub, there are people that are awesome at having um, ideas and, and others that are, that, that potentially aren't as rich or fertile with ideas. Um, we know who's, who's, who, who, who the go-to people are and, and who, who battle a bit more for whatever reason. So I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd, uh, you know, it's been a fascinating experience just being a copywriter per se and living in a world that started with a typewriter and ended up uh, where everything is your, is your, is you can work anywhere on, on the world. And I, and I certainly don't, um, I, I think you're limited by your own mindset, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've got two questions that I'm going to combo here. One is, uh, they're both really about timing and, and I guess sensitivity around when is it too soon or too late to, to communicate. The first one's with Sharon Dupassi. She says, the restaurant hotel industry has been hugely affected during this time. Do you think they can bounce back rather quickly or are we sitting with a long-term problem for them? Is it insensitive to push advertise for those industries now or do you think there's a market because people long for that experience? And then the other question from Tando is, uh, right now during this lockdown, liquor, liquor brands are struggling with advertising. What do you think they should be doing to ensure that their brands are still relevant in these times and obviously post the COVID lockdown? Yeah, I mean, that's why I include, included that one slide, which was that even in World War II, there were a lot of brands advertising, even though their brands weren't, um, weren't, uh, 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 weren't available or weren't on the shelf. And I, I thought that that was quite fascinating. But, 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 and the war was a long period, let's be honest. It was, uh, um, depending on who you were exactly, it was anything between six and four years. We're, we're three weeks into lockdown. Are we four? I've lost time. Um, we we're four weeks into lockdown. So this period has been incredibly concentrated. Um, people will, won't necessarily forget your brand name in this short period, but, but people will remember the role you played. And, and, um, and just because you're not on the shelf, I'm not sure going silent is necessarily the right response. And that's easier for me to say, because if your brand's not available, where do you find the cash to make advertising? So it's a complex set of, uh, set of, of, um, uh, sort of, set of uh, things that, are, that relate to each other, um, knock-on effect. But um, 
we know it's we know that there's never a bad time to advertise um when when you're down you advertise when you're up you advertise that advertising history there's been enough case studies historically to prove that your brands do fade from people's imaginations when you're not right in front of them um i think that people have withdrawn out of respect for the situation um and that's why this complex web of how does a brand communicate during the time of COVID is quite an important thing to think about. But, but I feel like already we are coming out. We, we are looking forward to some kind of um, relaxed uh, lockdown. We, we hope it's as, as, as early as next week, although uh, maybe not, but who knows? We're all guessing. But we, that doesn't mean just because you can't purchase the brands. You can, you can say something and do something um, and, and offer something. That's what we're in the credit business. Uh, make a plan, find a solution, make an offer, may buy it forward, do whatever it takes to keep that brand able to communicate in, in the now. Um, because uh, not, not a lot's going to happen for our industry and, and for our clients if, if we all just go quiet over this period. Yeah, what I really take out of that is, is it's, it's what they do and not what they say. And, and I, Al, I want to jump into the next question from Gary Wilmot. Uh, which I think is is relevant, um, and and also there's another question on the chat here that I, I think maybe you can talk to as well. Um, so so uh, Devault uh, on the chat asks, as a small and rather young agency, what advice do you have for me to attract new clients during this period of crisis? And I'm sure your answer, Al, is going to be do amazing work. But in conjunction with that, Gary asks, do you foresee agencies having to consider success-based pricing instead of time and materials? And I think that's going to be a very pertinent question over the next mm, six to 12 months what are your thoughts um a lot are a lot are already offering that a lot of uh, we i mean i know even even from the day we started 20 years ago we were prepared to put um and not always because you know uh this was even before the days of real procurement uh we were happy to put a bit of our profits on risk in order to be um uh, to be incentivized on the flip side but the problem the problem with those kinds of models is they're quite hard to prove <laughs> they're quite to measure ultimately and the link between advertising and and um and 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 performance is often a little gray uh and um it's easy if you're putting out a piece of retail and someone picks it up and you can tell whether the ad worked but in, uh, it's more vague when you start talking about brand building but i i think that what for me is slipping a little bit in our industry in fact slipping a lot is that there seem to be a lot more the, the relationship between agencies and marketers was a lot tighter in the past. And there was a sense of loyalty to each other um, that, that was a little bit deeper uh, than, than it currently is only because it's, we, we're in more of a business business relationship. Now we've got procurement that sits often sits between us. Um, your measurements are being measured quite, um, quite strictly and quite overtly. And, and, and they are also trying to, trying to maximize their investment with, their agency so um, it's very there's just no way to be there's no other way as a little agency than than to just be menacing um, as a credit incredibly menacing to be in the faces of um, the competitors I, I always try to think in small increments I always thought that actually when we got a client all I wanted to do was have the best piece of work on that client I wanted that client to be able to sit at a bry and go, someone said, ah, your, your work's amazing. It's much better than your competitor. I found that if you focused on that small little win, that what you did is that how pe that's how you, got, you caught people's attention. If you, were, if you were working on a little bank, make sure you had the best bank ad, the best bank communication. If you're working on a beer, make sure you had the best beer ad. Um, because I think that that's what marketers see. Um, they want marketers also want to be uh, successful marketers. They want they want work that's that's that makes them famous, that makes their brands talked about. Um, these are simple human emotions for me. And if you focus on that as a, as an agency, whether you're small or very very big, um, that's always that's always the challenge. Uh, you always have to outplay your 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 rivals, um, and. And I find that when you were a small agency, you had to you had to use you had to start the small things. So you better write the best radio spot to 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 get noticed, and then you better write the best leaflet, and you better then write the first uh, fifteen second TV ad because the the stature grows. You just have to and yeah you have to make your mark at every single level of your growth. 
is the only way to do that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, a, a comment from me on the on agencies working on performance. Um, I, I think your, your comment around trust is, is a pivotal one and, and it's not something that is as prominent between client and agency as it was 10, 20 years ago. The other thing I find is that clients often uh, get in the way of themselves. And I'm reminded of a, of a big client we won at Quirk about 10, 12 years ago. I won't mention their name, a big hotel brand. And they wanted us to work on performance and actually we were quite keen to do so. It's a very uh, good industry online and it was growing fast back then. Um, but we said to the client, you, you, you have to let us put a booking engine or at least a request uh, for availability on the homepage rather than the full screen image of Charlize Theron, which takes up your homepage. And their response was, well, we paid her $20 million for her endorsement. We're gonna use her image on our homepage. And obviously, as a digital marketer, we're thinking, you know, people don't come to your site to look at Charlie's. They come to book a hotel room, but the client was adamant, and, and therefore, we did not work on performance. Um, I do, I hope that clients are a bit wiser these days. Um, Alan, I'm going to jump to the next question before we wrap up. A very important one from an anonymous attendee who asks if you could please open the bar. <laughs> Just jokes. Uh, someone actually did write that. But, um, Al, my last question, I think it's, it's a very pertinent one to end on with for you. Uh, it's from Suvesh, and he asks, um, people believe creativity is something you are blessed with. Is it not more like a muscle that you train and develop? People who think that they will be creative when the time comes, will they be as successful as people who, for whom being creative, who are being creative and ideating all the time? What's your, what's your point of view on creativity, nature versus nurture? Uh, yeah, my, you know, my dad, my dad, who was an engineer and, and, um, I wouldn't say that I came from a particularly creative background, but he once said to me in a moment of, um, in a kind of a quiet moment when we were sitting having a whiskey, he once said to me, how did you turn out the way you turned out? So I said, what do you mean? He said, how did you be, end up being this creative thing? Because there's nothing, it's not, we genetically didn't give it to you and you certainly seem to have developed it in your own manner. And I, and I think that um, I'm a firm believer that, uh, that your brain is a muscle and whatever you, whatever you, whatever you work at, you will, you will acquire the, the expertise you need. So if you, if you start focusing on figures, you eventually you get an, an intuition and astuteness with figures. Um, and I think creativity is, is very much that thing. I don't think you're born, born necessarily born creative. I think it's something that you have to practice and you have to learn. And even at the age of 25, I still had no idea how to have an idea. In fact, I was using 95% of my energy trying to have an idea. And, and even when I had an idea, I had no idea if it was a good idea. And I would just chase myself in circles, battling with my own ability to have a thought. And, and I remember one day I just thought, this is exhausting. I'm, stop I'm not going to read any books about how to have idea, how, how to have ideas. I'm not going to read any more reference um, uh, 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 guidelines on, on and conceptual thinking. I'm just going to sit and have an idea. And then I'd have an idea. And then I'd say, okay, right, I'm putting that aside. I'm going to have another idea. And then I'm going to have another idea. And I'm going to have another idea. And, the, and, and, and I guess over time between that and, 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 and 30 years when, when I started King James um, with James, um, I think that's when I developed my real, I guess, flair. And it was... By, it was simply by grinding out ideas. It was not. It was not a. It, it wasn't eureka moments. It was just, well, oh, what if I did this? 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 What? And the trick is to do to that a lot and to do lots of ideas. Um, I've seen people have come to me with one idea or two ideas, and I'm going, what are you doing? Is that all you've had in two days? Two ideas? Come on, where's the other ones? And you can see they either gave up or they or the 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 creative process made them exhausted or, or made them anxious, but they're just ideas. If you treat them with too much um, respect or too much, um, if you make, if you put them up on a pedestal and make them hard to attain, you'll, you'll battle to have them. Ideas are just thoughts, write them down, do this. What if we did this? But it's as simple as that. And, and that kind of practice, I think makes that muscle, the creative muscle grow a bit. So, um, don't, don't ever blame your parents for, for, for maybe not having the creative gene. I think it's in you. You just haven't quite massaged it yet. I concur. I, I did say that would be the last question, Al, but um, 
I have to ask a last question. It's coming from uh, a guy called John. I think he's in the marketing department of Pick and Pay. Maybe you know him. Uh, uh, he asks, how do you help clients overcome their indecision given the uncertain times we are in? And I think that's a very relevant question that I'd love your thoughts on. I thought he was going to ask you, where aren't you meant to be on a pre-production right now? Um, you know, it's, this is a really hard job that we do. We all do. Um, if anyone, uh, one of my South Africa at the time, and he won the first result, and he said to me, there's not a single job that I sit down with um, and feel I'm not going to, I feel and feel that I'm going to crack it. He says, I always feel like a failure. I, I, I always get this anxiety that I'm going to make this work. And I, I love to hear that from such a great writer because it told me that, that this anxiety that you have in coming up with an idea um, is, never goes away. I, I get it um, constantly. And I think it's the same with making decisions. I think you, you, um, you, 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 it, it's approving ideas as well as having ideas is a confidence thing. And you, with practice, you, you start to get more and more comfortable and more and more confident with, with, with the thing that you're feeling. Um, I've seen clients uh, who, who love an idea intuitively immediately go, oh, that's nice. And then over the next um, day or two, talk themselves out of the idea because, because anyone can point out what could go wrong. Anyone can add a reason why it's going to be messed up. Every, anyone can tell you what's wrong and what's, what the shortcoming of the idea is. Um, and silencing that is so critical to being able to have an idea as well as to approve an idea. Um, trusting that initial feeling you had, which is that, man, that felt good. Um, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but man, I, I trust it feels good. Uh, and I trust that um, you'll make it good. And you know what? Sometimes, more often than not, we do make it good. And sometimes we do um, not necessarily get it right. Uh, and, and the trick is to keep doing it, though. Um, when, you get, when you start becoming afraid of, of ideas uh, and, you, and you start treating every idea like that it's the last idea you're going to have or the last piece of advertising you're ever going to make, you find yourself putting that idea under so much pressure and, under, and, and, and you, you keep so much responsibility on that idea. So I think keeping moving forward is really for me the art of, of, of creativity is that nothing destroys um, creative people, um, agencies and clients when, 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 they, when, 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 they didn't, when they don't create things together. Um, it's so important to create things together, to take chances together, and to be held accountable together. Great, thank you, Al. Uh, I think we need to wrap it up there. You are amazing, as always. Thank you so much. It was a great way to end our digital agency showcase. I'm just looking at the comments here. Uh, really amazing things. Uh, such a privilege uh, to have you speaking for us. Thank you so much.